Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Guys, I'm so, so sorry. It's taken me so long to get back to you to do part two of my podcast on career advice as to why you should pursue a career in the critical care. And this applies to whether you are a nurse practitioner, PA, nurse, respiratory therapist, or physician. With the current situation that's going on at the moment, we're noticing how important it is to have adequate staff at your facility of critical care doctors. So this podcast should be hopefully a motivator for you. And if you want to go back to look for part one, I think I recorded it in September of this year. I think September 21st was when I actually did it. So you're going to have to scroll back quite a little bit on the podcast feed. And if you've been waiting for part two, again, I apologize for making you wait for so long. If you missed part one, go back and check that out because there I discuss why you should pursue critical care, what fellowship training is all about, how you can supplement the fi financial opportunity cost that's lost because of fellowship, different training programs for PAs and NPs, the emotional benefits of added training, the job security that comes with critical care, as well as other things. So coming into part two right now, the first thing I want to discuss is the scheduling logistics that come with critical care. And I'm not talking about pulmonary critical care where people have to divide themselves between doing clinic work as well as actual ICU work, but more so for those of us who are just pure critical care who trained in either anesthesia, surgery, uh, internal medicine, the different, the different subspecialties. Because the schedule that I was most commonly offered was this seven on seven off schedule, which is the one I chose and which is amazing. There are other schedules that exist out there that are three days on, four days off, four days on, three days off, but that just wasn't for me. Personally, I enjoy the seven on seven off schedule. I've been doing it for three and a half years now, and personally, I love it. It definitely has some drawbacks, as I mentioned in my reasons as to why you should not do critical care, but the fact that you could get on an airplane on a Monday or on a Monday morning or even a Sunday night and stay somewhere during weekday flight prices and lower hotel rates, I mean, that's a win-win-win in my book. If you're really, really tired, you could even go ahead and relax on the plane while you recover. Another additional benefit is that during that week, you could definitely spend more time with your family. You could go to the grocery store when everybody else is working. I live in Florida, so you could go to the beach when it's empty, if that's your thing. And in my opinion, everything has its pros, everything has its cons, but you have to find in your life the things that the situations where the pros definitely outweigh the cons. And in my opinion, this is one of them. Having the ability to tune out of clinical work for a week at a time is great for one's mental health. In my case, it's great for my mental health because I get to work on, you know, creating podcasts, YouTube videos, Instagram posts, etc. It helps restore the sanity from the intensity of the everyday job of actually being in the ICU. It was funny because I recently spoke to a pharmacist who, an ICU pharmacist who I work with, who is also on a seven on seven off schedule. And just like me, around day six of being off day seven, we're already itching to get back to work. That may be a byproduct of the fact that I'm three years, three and a half years out of training and I haven't gotten tired of it yet. I, I wonder how I'm going to do, you know, in like 10 years or something like that, but only time will tell and we'll go on this journey together so that I could feel like I'm getting paid to do it. One of the things when you sign up to do critical care is that you're going to have to work nights, guys. There's there's no other way around it. People get sick 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yes, I stuttered when I said that because I forgot how many days are in a year. Just kidding. I just stuttered because I did. But when you work nights, the truth is that you may be able to get some sleep here and there. Obviously, your shop may vary. You definitely have to be ready to get up and work if you're in-house taking call. Don't be that doctor who just sleeps through all the nurses' pages because that's that's just not right. That's not good. There may be some good nights, uh, which one celebrates in the morning where you can sleep through the whole night and boom, the next day you get to have a regular day, which is like a day off. Obviously, these things are rare, but essentially you're being paid to sleep. There's a term in the moonlighting community that's called, quote, sleep for dollars, end quote. I never actually found one of those gigs, but I've heard that they exist in some places where they just need a warm body to be present at night. You obviously have to be ready to work, though. I don't know where any of these places are, so don't message me asking me for recommendations. But you should let me know if you go ahead and find one because I'd like to moonlight there. Some institutions and different shops have either an NP or a PA covering nights, and you have to be immediately accessible over the phone for whatever needs that they have, which is definitely reasonable and acceptable, and be ready to come in. I mean, you got to be prepared for that too. Generally speaking, nights are often slower than day shifts, depending on where you work, of course. 
but you don't have to be bogged down by the fact that on nights you don't have to round on your patients. And for the most part, the mentality is to just hold down the fort and put out fires. Usually long discussions with families and updates for them typically don't happen at night. One could go ahead and leverage this downtime to either read a book, pay bills, watch a movie, work out in the call room, amongst other activities. I know I leave, I leave certain you know mindless tasks that I don't want to do on my free time. I leave them for when I'm on night shift. Obviously, patient care comes first, of course. I know that there are people out there who are a little overly sensitive, who are listening to this, and they're appalled. But honestly, just take a step back and think of all the times that people play on their phone with their work. Take a chill pill. If you don't want to go ahead and work nights, you could look for opportunities at facilities where they have tele-ICU coverage at night or something that's called EICU. At these institutions, usually the emergency department takes care of the necessary procedures and the hospitalist holds down the fort with regards to admission. If you're looking at supplementing your income, you could look at doing tele-ICU yourself. This is honestly going to be a more popular option as time passes simply because the market is trying to adjust to the fact that there aren't enough critical care doctors to go around. I've honestly done EICU before in one of my moonlighting gigs, and let's just say that the eight hours went by rather quickly and the compensation was rather lucrative. If you are a nurse or respiratory therapist, and this is intrinsic to the nurse and respiratory therapist job, yes, you'll have t three typically grueling days on, but then you have four days off to do whatever you want. If you wanna pick up an extra shift, make more money, done. If you wanna go on a quick vacation, done. You could take days off during the week to run errands. And in all honesty, my wife, who's a critical care nurse, she and I coordinate our schedules to capitalize on these days off. Keep in mind that there may be a differential in compensation if you work a lot of nights or weekends. At the end of the day, people really don't want to work nights nor weekends. So this, this might be a place to negotiate your salary. If you're a physician and you like working nights, become a nocturnist and you'll make quite the premium financially. Nurses and other staff could earn extra compensation for working night shifts, not to mention that there's some handsome bonuses at certain institutions when you sign on to work nights. Some people may take issue with the fact that they have to work 10 plus hour shifts, but as a physician, working the long shifts help you retain ownership of your patients. There are fewer handoffs, which lead to fewer issues. Residency as well as fellowship trains you to be able to cover the long shifts without any challenges. Critical care nurses, respiratory therapists, and other teammates generally have 12-hour shifts anyway. And, you know, I say 12-hour shifts, but I know you all get there 15, 20 minutes early, perhaps even 30. And, you know, handoff does not actually take place. And you're never out the door at, at 7 o'clock. And when I say handoffs do not take place, handoffs do not take place fast enough for you to get off at 7 o'clock or, you know, to, to do 12 hours exactly. And as this becomes a normal, you won't see it as being as a, an eternal proposition. This just actually becomes a normal for you. A 12-hour shift, that's what it is. And sometimes you get excited when the day gets rather busy because it goes by quickly if the acuity is high. Next up, let's talk about actually doing the job of critical care, starting with the business and dynamics. Do you have an inclination towards a business? Well, then go ahead and pursue private practice. Do you want to join a practice where you just show up to your shift, do your job, and walk out? Well, then a hospital-owned practice might be your cup of tea. Want to join an academic hospital and teach residents? Well, there's an opportunity to do that too. There are lots of different options for your needs and desires. If you don't want to touch patients and be a pseudo-radiologist, just kidding, guys. But you could try tele-ICU or what's also called EICU. I personally work in a private practice group that's subcontracted to cover ICUs at several different hospitals. It's a pulmonary critical care group. I can't get into too much detail about this because... Um, you know, there's there's a lot of transparency that I'm aware of, of the operational costs of running a pulmonary clinic, pay, paying the salaries of numerous people on the staff that I'm just not going to get into. But it's rather eye-opening to see the amount of money spent to comply with regulations for those who want to reduce the cost of healthcare. Open ICUs, which is where one co-manages patients with a hospitalist, have the advantage where you may not need to do transfer summaries, med recs on admission, HMPs. And you also won't get calls for melatonin, for example, in the middle of the night for a patient who can't sleep or Tylenol for a fever. You won't need to worry about simple diabetes management either. Your focus will be on the critical, co critical components of patient management. If you're working in a closed ICU, though, it's all on you and your direct team. And that's okay, too. It becomes quite empowering when a consultant calls you and asks you for help. It's a good feeling when you have the level of training to be able to take care of anybody. And that's what a critical care fellowship provides. It's also a great opportunity to help educate your colleagues and work together to build better care for patients rather than 
them waiting for too long, for example, and not consulting you on time. That will lead to bad outcomes for the patients. Also, it builds a great level of trust between the colleagues and yourself. The opportunity for open discussion is absolutely amazing. The chances of being dumped on decreases dramatically when you have open lines of communication with your, with your fellow colleagues. Turns out that there's a lot of camaraderie in all that, and I personally love my hospitalist friends, such of, several of which are social media celebrities, such as uh, Dr. Wargames, who is one of the hospitalists who I work with directly. During the podcast I created where I discussed the reasons why you should not go into critical care medicine, which honestly was not meant to deter anybody, but to be very realistic about what it means to go into critical care medicine, I commented on the small margin of error that we all have to face every single day. In critical care, you have a very narrow window to save a patient's life. And this is a challenge, no doubt about it. But the truth is that you become used to this. You trained for this. It hones in on your brain. You're used to it. You become effective, very efficient. You know, there are bigger stakes in all this and there are bigger victories. To be able to save somebody's life, which is something I'm going to get into in part three of this podcast, is no small feat. There's a saying by the great David Goggins where he makes references to the big wins as deposits in the cookie jar. When the going gets tough, you reach into the cookie jar and take one out. This concludes part two of this podcast on why you should pursue critical care medicine. In part three, I'm going to be discussing other things such as interdisciplinary and interpersonal practice, the big saves and wins, family relationships and family dynamics, as well as death. So stay tuned for that. Shouldn't be too long. It's not going to take me two and a half months or so to do that particular episode like it took me to do this one. Thank you all for your support. I appreciate all your feedback and comments. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye.